Uh, thank you, Maya, for the pres uh, for the really wonderful introduction, um, and also for giving me the, and Cynthia the opportunity to participate in this event. Um, we also want to thank the audience that's currently um, attending uh, this presentation, and you hope you'll find our presentation to be interesting and informative at the same time. So before we begin, um, I'd like to give you a brief outline of how our presentation will look like. And um, if you look um, at the list, you'll notice that at the end we'll have an interactive session whereby you can ask questions and we'll try and answer. And we can also have discussions. And if time allows, we'll, we'll have a quiz um, related to what we get to uh, present um, um, in a few minutes. Okay, so I start and I just want to give you a brief overview about Kenya. So Kenya is a very beautiful country located in the east coast of Africa. Um, it is about 580,000 kilometers squared. And if we compare to Austria, it's roughly seven times the size of Austria. Um, according to the last uh, 2019 uh, census, um, census uh, count, uh, the current population at, in Kenya is um, at 47.5 million inhabitants. Kenya is a country that's also rich in um, uh, cultural diversity with about four, 42 um, ethnic communities. So the na national languages that are spoken in Kenya are Swahili. And for those who are not familiar with Swahili, if you hear the word Hakuna Matata, you know that's a Swahili word and also English. Something else about Kenya is that um, it is the economic, financial and transport hub of East Africa. And it is actually the second largest economy after Ethiopia. And since 2014, we have been ranked as a low middle income country. So since this presentation is about uh, nature conservation, I think it will do as justice to talk about the biodiversity um, that uh, or the biodiversity asset in Kenya. So um, Kenya, apart from being rich in cultural diversity, we also we also have really really diverse landscapes and ecosystems that range from savannas to deserts to highlands, and all these ecosystems enable Kenya to host a wide or a diverse uh, species community which can be simply summarized in this table. So this is the latest, this table shows the latest biodiversity asset of Kenya, um, according to the taxonomic groups and the number of individuals that exist. So despite of our rich biodiversity, um, we have, um, I'd like to share something more about uh, how things are actually on the ground. So we have, uh, we are rich in biodiversity, but only 8% of the country landmass is covered by protected area systems, which include national parks, uh, national and marine parks, national reserves and sanctuaries. Additionally, we have only 257 sites that are covered by natural forests, and these 257 sites only represent 4.2% of the entire Kenyan landmass. Thirdly, 65% of our wildlife live outside protected areas. And this, from this particular statistic, you can see that um, yeah, um, our, there might be uh, several challenges that might, uh, that the biodiversity in Kenya might be undergoing. Yeah, so now I'll give the floor to Cynthia to talk about the history of um, conservation in Kenya. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for making time to be here with us today. So uh, in order to really um, understand uh, the problems and opportunities um, in conservation space in Kenya, I think that it's very important and it would be very interesting to go through the history of the country uh, in terms of uh, ownership of wildlife, um, governance of wildlife, as well as the utilization in different time periods, uh, just to get to how the, it's 
challenges and opportunities kind of have been created um, uh, as an as an influence of the history and the history is not just important it's also very interesting sometimes um so there are very many lessons we can take from the history that then help us shape the future of nature conservation in Kenya and uh, I could say generally nature conservation and protected uh, uh, lands uh, worldwide. Um, so just to begin with the phases, uh, we'll, I'll take you through three different phases of um, uh, nature conservation and uh, utilization of uh, wildlife um, heritage. Um, so I'll take you through the pre-colonial times and then I'll take you through the colonial period and well, some of the experiences from those, those two periods and some of the practices. And then I'll also take you through the uh, colon independent period. So once uh, Kenya gained her independence all the way up to say roughly up to this to date, um, uh, just so we can understand how some of these problems have come up and how some of the challenges uh, do exist and how, which periods they ended up uh, create, I mean, created some of these issues. Um, so uh, to begin with the pre-colonial phase, so this is the period up until um, before the British came to Kenya. And this period, also consists of the times when there was the, the Indians and the Arabs, they already arrived earlier on um, before uh, the British. And there's some of that history is also uh, uh, captured in this time period of the pre-colonial phase. Um, so to begin with, uh, in the pre-colonial times, uh, wildlife heritage in Kenya basically uh, consisted of a, a communal based um, utilization and, and uh, ownership of wildlife. And this was characterized by um, members of Kenyan clans and ethnic groups um, valuing wildlife in between with, within their communities, within their villages, and uh, within their tribes and clans, and the uh, animals and the people, when the animals are not individually owned, so they, it was a property of of the community uh, as a whole. Um, and this was at the time before uh, what many term invasion of Africa, you'd say, and. Uh, during this time, um, the needs anim, uh, use the use of animal was based on needs and the culture of the of the people and the cultural practices of these uh, different ethnic groups in Kenya that uh, uh, Noreen mentioned earlier. I mean, over time, these ethnic groups have increased, so it, it, they are not exactly uh, forty plus, but uh, fewer, but uh, regardless, there were still uh, the ones that felt uh, the animals were part of the community. They were part of uh, um, their way of life, and and they treasured animals. Most communities did treasure the animals. It's also said that uh, communities didn't hunt except during uh, drought seasons and uh, whenever livestock were sick, say from some diseases and uh, things like that. So, um, but maybe um, um, from time to time when it was needed, people did hunt, but some, but this is, this is also usually, um, if you, if you read some, some of the references, you'll see that they say that some communities, it's not always that all communities were in harmony with that wildlife, but majority were, and that was the common practice, was to treat animals in a treasured ma manner. In fact, some of the animals were even uh, idolized or used for specific uh, community practices, uh, like uh, 
uh, when they when young boys needed to be um, to move from a certain age, uh, how how do I put it? Um, to to go to be to be taught how to hunt and gather sometimes, but those were again special special cases, uh, and also special com specific communities. Uh, it's also often reported that this period had the largest wildlife um, numbers, and this could uh, this could all be associated with the fact that there were not so the population of Kenya at that time was quite low. Um, it could also be uh, because there was uh, lots of land space because there was not so many settlers and uh, people lived in specific villages. There was not uh, so much um, um, movement and construction of permanent housing like today. So it was uh, a time that uh, sometimes is said to uh, animals and people lived in harmony. Uh, I mean, sometimes when you read about it, it sounds almost like a, a fairy tale. But uh, <laughs> I, I'm I'm not the most pessimistic uh, person when it comes to the history. I try to give it a chance. Uh, maybe some of you are the same. And uh, despite the ease in access uh, to wildlife at that time, there were a few communities that were also known for. Um, to use wildlife as a source of food, uh, clothing, and uh, currency, especially with the arrival of the Arabs and the Indians uh, at the coast of Kenya. Uh, and and um, once the Arabs arrived, they, they be, there was a kind of like an international trade introduced to the region, uh, to the Kenyan people and certain communities like the Kambas. So they started hunting uh, to uh, transport uh, some animal skin and uh, things like this to the coast. In fact, it said that uh, by the 1840s, some communities like the Kamba were sending about five tons of five tons of uh, ivory to the coast every week uh, to transport to certain parts of the world, um, like even to Portugal sometimes, because the Arabs worked also closely with the Portuguese at that time. Um, and uh, during this same phase, this, this arrival of, uh, of, of the uh, Arabs and the Indians uh, also kind of started causing attraction to the region. And as a consequence, uh, we'll see that colonialism kind of uh, Rose because came up because as as a result of this, so ivory trade is often said to be a major driving force in the scramble for Africa, uh, uh, for African resources, which eventually contributed to significance in a justification for colonialism of the African society. So they say that uh, because of the Arabs. Uh, getting uh, access to ivory and animal skin during that time, that later it started attracting uh, Europeans and um, the Americans to the region so that they could come and see uh, where is it this place that people can get all this uh, ivory. And yeah, so uh, that, that was, this was also towards the end of this period was the, when the invasion of the African continent began. And then I take it through the colonial phase. So then the colonial phase uh, for many, the, the rich wildlife heritage in, in Africa and basically in, in Kenya at that time uh, attracted uh, many colonial, colonial, colonial groups and they were interested uh, to come and see, but also to come and uh, get a share of what the rich wildlife heritage in Kenya could, uh, they could, their hands in the share of this. And so uh, this period extends from the 90s, so the, the late 19th century to the nine, to, to just the year before the Ken independence of Kenya. Kenya had her independence in 1963. So up to 1962, we look at this period. And this period was uh, said to be 
um, there were very many explorers during this, this time. Um, there was a lot of hunting and, um, uh, and this was the period that the British, the British are the, uh, were the group that, colon the country that colonized Kenya. And there were very many explorers, mainly from Europe and America and other adventurers arriving in Kenya, mainly for hunting and for sightseeing. Um, one of the main developers of this, um, developments of this uh, uh, time, some, some of the uh, main infrastructure developments of this time was the Kenya-Uganda Railway, uh, which uh, resulted in, in, it kind of facilitated uh, the hunting and, and uh, uh, operations, the hunting operations from the region. So there was more access to move freely with, uh, within Kenya without uh, needing to use, say, donkeys and, and um, horses. And so it sped up uh, this wildlife hunting and, and uh, uh, caused the whole business in the region. Uh, this same period, there was also a lot of professional hunters visiting the region. In fact, in 1907, uh, um, Winston Churchill visited Kenya uh, as an official uh, member of the British colonial uh, class to uh, hunt. And he, he, was, he hunted uh, quite a bit in the region. And it was, uh, his visit was, he narrated his visit as enjoyable and, and he was, very proud to have shot a good number of warthogs and uh, gazelles and all these animals. And, and then later on, about two years later, the former president of um, of United States, the 26th president of United States, uh, what's his name? Theodore Rose, Theodore uh, Roosevelt. Uh, he visited Kenya uh, just after, he, just immediately after his um, he end, his presidency ended in 1909, and he stayed in Kenya for almost one year, uh, touring and hunting. He came, he arrived there with a large group of professional hunters, and he, as recorded by him in his own book, actually, he wrote that he he hunted close to 300 animals, killing about eight elephants, nine lions, a good number of gazelles, and uh, 30, almost 30 rhinos he killed at that time, uh, uh, as documented. And uh, this period was also said to be the period where Kenya lost uh, majority of his uh, wildlife heritage without compensation. So communities did not gain from this uh, hunting. It was just free and it was just the colonial elite uh, running things at that time. Um, another thing that it would be interesting to remember is that while all this was going on, um, it was not exactly illegal. It was not illegal actually at that time. It was the while the the behavior is questionable morally, if you could say, uh, it was not illegal. It was uh, just the time and uh, the time and the period allowed people to behave this way um, and to be proud of uh, this kind of behavior. And the years leading to the Kenyan independence, uh, some changes uh, were made. So after the Second World War, um, there was, um, because during the Second World War, there was a lot of uh, hunting also to feed troops. And the, uh, also the, even the Kenyan leaders at that time, the Kenyan uh, freedom fighters, they were also hunting at that time to survive in the bushes while they were hiding from the colonialists. So there was a, a lot of hunting during this, that time. And uh, as a result, once things came down, there were a lot of uh, discussions on how to conserve uh, wildlife. And uh, it's um, also documented that some of the people that 
that were really interested in hunting and that were hunting a lot uh, previous in the previous years uh, also became champions for conservation and um, and for wildlife tourism. So they were some of the people who ended up again coming back to start uh, the argument that it was important to conserve wildlife and and that uh, the numbers had decreased dramatically. And so they were all making these arguments that it's important to establish uh, game parks. And uh, yeah, and there were the same same group of people that were stressing the need for people to live in harmony with uh, uh, wildlife again. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that we could go to the next phase, the final phase of the time periods. So then we come to the independence phase and from the independent, once Kenya gained her independence, uh, we see that majority of the uh, legislations and the policies that were implemented at this time kind of borrowed from uh, the period just before independence. So when everybody was starting to be more aware, when the colonialists were starting to be more aware of the importance of conservation. And so they kind of borrowed from, uh, to continue some of these arguments uh, for themselves. It, um, in this time, uh, wildlife was cut, the, the government, both the government of Kenya at that time as well as other uh, interest groups, private sector, were very interested in, in participating in conservation. Um, many of this, um, it's some, this uh, criticism though that many of the private sector groups were still very foreign and were still uh, uh, predominantly people who had already behaved very poorly previously uh, when it comes to wildlife, uh, with uh, in, when it comes to hunting and things like this. So there was still some criticisms. However, the, uh, the after independence, there was a lot of work to be done. So there was also just focus on fixing things rather than debating uh, uh, about who needs to do what. However, the wildlife ownership and utilization uh, at that time even though they adopted a lot of these old frames, uh, uh, many Ke Kenyan political elite were very keen uh, again over time on how to bring the community back to participating in wildlife. Some of these reasons were because uh, this same period, there was still a lot of uh, illegal hunting going on. There was still a lot of um, illegal activities going on and so to, they quickly realized that it was very important to start involving communities uh, more uh, in order to for them to participate in security and, and, and making sure that uh, people were aware that whatever was going on and was not supposed to be going on. Um, and uh, between uh, the 90, the, uh, between 1970s and 1977, uh, Kenya lost uh, nearly half of its uh, elephant population. And um, it's also documented that in 1973, there were about 130,000 elephants, but uh, the, no, about, actually 1972, there were one, 140,000, but by 1973, they, they reduced to 130. And, uh, Right now, uh, the latest uh, census says there are actually about 35,000. So we are, the number keeps uh, changing from time to time. So uh, most uh, authors summarize that it's about 50,000 or below 50,000 uh, because the number varies from year to year as well. Um, and uh, it's the same. I think with rhinos as well, the number is usually almost uh, in the same range, rhinos and elephants. Um, and the Kenya wildlife was formed in 1989. Some also say 
Um, maybe that's when it actually came into effect. And the purpose of Kenya Wildlife was to um, um, to conserve and manage uh, Kenya's wildlife. Um, and to date, they manage most of the national parks uh, with the exception of the Maasai Mara that is managed by the community, by the local community. But majority of, uh, even in the Maasai Mara, they have their presence there. They educate the local people and uh, they participate in community education of wildlife and and things like this. So it's a, it's a very, it's a very hands-on institution. It's a government corporation actually. Um, and they, I think also in 2013, uh, the Kenyan government, the latest act of parliament that has to do with the wildlife policies and wildlife management was really re revised and reviewed and updated. And that was the last time that they updated it, but there are usually a lot of uh, issues that come up. And for the Kenyan government to show their consideration and their commitment to wildlife, they've joined a couple of um, conventions, including the um, the Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. They've also joined the Convention of Migratory Species, as well as the UNESCO World Heritage um, Convention, uh, uh, to name but a few. And it's the Kenyan government in recent years has been really committed to, to, um, to involving the communities and the local people in wildlife conservation, even though um, there's still a lot of criticism that it's, uh, there's uh, a lack of participation from certain groups, including academia, so not so many people in academia are directly participating. Uh, there are also criticisms that the, that uh, Kenyan, the Kenyan elite, so those who have quite a, uh, some financially, I mean, those who are quite wealthy, uh, tend not to directly donate uh, and uh, to some of his uh, conservation efforts. And there's that there's a lot of blame uh, from uh, many groups, but not so much partic direct participation. Um, it's also the Kenyan government is often uh, criticized for not involving uh, the Kenyan, Ken, other Kenyans in different fields, including academia in policy making. Um, and so there's a lot of blame to go around from the various stakeholders. Uh, and I, and I would say that is, those are some of the challenges, but uh, there's uh, more complaining and more finger pointing and less work, but we could do more. And there's so much to be proud of as a country in terms of uh, uh, wildlife and also culture and, and many communities that are still very keen to do more and to, to, to preserve wildlife. The, the, the mentality is still there. It's just not well tapped into, I would say. So with that, with that brief history, we can go to the to discussing some of the problems and challenges, uh, so that it now becomes clear and what are some of the issues that we do have directly right now. Thanks, Noreen. Okay, so as um, Cynthia has discuss the history of Kenya's conservation. I think we can try and look at now the opportunities and challenges that the conservation scene in Kenya face. And maybe to some extent, we can be able to actually see how our history or the history shaped or influenced um, these two dynamics. So with, uh, with the opportunities for nature conservation, I think the first, uh, opportunity to look at is the local communities. And um, I think from Cynthia's presentation or yeah, explanation, we can actually see that the local communities actually play 
a really important role in the Kenyan conservation space. They, in so many ways, um, shape the way the conservation scene was in the past and is at the and the, and the way it is currently. So we can see or we can learn from Cynthia's pre, uh, explanation that local communities, especially during the colonial era, were um, were actually excluded from conservation initiatives. And this is because most of the approaches that were used, can, which we can refer to as fortress conservation, secluded them from, um, or secluded communities um, from conservation spaces and also from utilization of wildlife resources. However, this narrative changed and a lot of com local communities were started uh, started to get involved um, in in conservation activities. For instance, in 1991, the Kenya Wildlife Service, which Cynthia mentioned, um, tried to include or tr uh, extended uh, conservation activities outside protected areas and into community lands, and also in involved the local communities in conservation activities and practices. And then later, with it, uh, between uh, 2004 and 2013, um, the conservation initiatives, especially in community lands and involving co local communities, further increased. And this can uh, this um, participation of local communities in conservation actually accounts for the for about 65 percent of the conservation areas in Kenya. And if we try to illustrate this, we, we showed a map. I would like to show you a map of Kenya. Um, just a minute. So this is Kenya. This is the map of Kenya showing the distribution of protected areas, which are state-owned. But if we now consider local communities, we can see that the space for conservation, the spaces that now um, involve conservation, especially in community land, have actually increased. So this shows that they, there is more opportunities to improve uh, conservation of species in Kenya, especially in community land. And it's good to see that this has happened in the past few decades or in the, in the past 10 years. Secondly, um, we can look at conservation from an aspect of tourism. So tourism, um, um, so Kenya has been voted as the leading tourist or travel destination in Africa in 2019 and 2020. Unfortunately, we lost to Tanzania last year. And one of the things that actually attracts a lot of tourism activity in Kenya is our wildlife resource. And um, and we have usually get so many tourists visiting our national parks and reserves to enjoy safaris and to see wildlife in their in their natural habitat. So um, tourism is a very important um, economic or uh, foreign exchange earner for uh, for Kenya, as it, it contributes to 9.3 percent of our gross um, of our gross domestic product, which can be easily translated to about one billion US dollars. Another advantage tourism has in the Kenyans um, uh, in Kenya is that it has helped helped to uh, alleviate poverty, as it provides a lot of employment opportunities, especially for the local communities who tend to live close to the wildlife, um, who tend to live close to wildlife and hotels that are built next to this, um, uh, that are built uh, next to these uh, wildlife areas in terms of, for example, next to the national parks and reserves and conservancies. Another thing that tourism has helped to do is to promote um, conservation of species and um, ecosystems. It has also helped to change the attitude, especially of the local communities. So they tend to see wildlife more as a resource and as beneficial to them. But this, again, can be debated. And last but not least, it has also helped to create a lot of um, um, our awareness on the um, conservation status of some of the species that um, yeah, some of the species that may be considered to be endangered or soon to face extinction. Um, another opportunity we want to look at in um, with regards to 
um, conservation in Kenya is in the area of research, innovation, and technology. So I think one thing that's very obvious is that you cannot conserve what you do not know. And research is then one of the avenues that actually help Kenya as a country to get to know its biodiversity asset and what trends um, this biodiversity is going maybe with regards to certain issues. So um, the research scene in Kenya has grown over the years and it has, a lot, it has attracted a lot of local and international researchers. So the research, um, so since there's a lot of um, interest in research or conservation research in Kenya, we see, we've seen several government institutions um, try to regulate and standardize um, research activity in the country in the form of, uh, um, in the form of uh, offering research permits and licenses. And this has also helped to uh, standardize and re reduce uh, malpractice or uh, reduce ethical and ethical issues re with regards to wildlife conservation and research. Um, another thing we can talk about research and growth in Kenya is that it has become more inclusive. So we, we get to see now more youth and women um, in the research scene in Kenya, for instance, Cynthia and I, um, we, yeah, we have a chance to actually practice uh, um, or we get to study and actually practice actively in issues related to conservation in Kenya. Um, also, we, in terms of inclusivity, we've seen that some research organizations are trying to include indigenous knowledge um, in, in their research to try and understand certain patterns and also try and better conserve species. And as you've heard before, during the colonial era, indigenous knowledge was actually perceived to be very primitive and it was never really considered when it came to conservation of species. Um, another thing about inclusivity and research in Kenya is that um, now uh, we have more species being researched on or being studied. If you look at the past, you'll notice the species which were regarded as being charismatic or sexy, like the lion, the elephant and stuff, were the ones which researchers mostly focused on. But now if you look at uh, taxonomic groups such as insects, reptiles, amphibians, rodents and bats, and this was species that were highly ignored in the past. So we're slowly are moving to innovation. And one of the most spectacular um, innovation or innovative ideas in the field of conservation in Kenya uh, was sometime in 2000 um, or during the, it was around, uh, let me say 2010 or earlier. And this innovative, um, this innovation was by an 11 year old Maasai boy um, who created or who invented um, a device which is called the lion light, which is a flashing light that deters lions from uh, from the livestock at night. So this was a really great um, innovative innovation by this young boy, and he he has been featured a lot in um, in the TED talks and stuff. So if you want to learn more about it, you can look at it. But this shows that this um, yeah, innovation is also like these innovative ideas are actually helping the conservation scene um, in Kenya. Um, another thing I'd like to talk about is with technology. Nowadays, um, I think uh, conservation and researchers or conservation researchers are tapping into technology to try and improve, um, to try and improve um, different uh, uh, aspects of research. For instance, they're trying to simplify methods, or they're using technology to simplify methods of data collection. And also with the simplification of data collection methods, they are then able to also involve the public in data collection analysis. And, and I think this is such a great idea um, um, in the conservation field. And another thing is that uh, with technology, uh, most institutions are actually trying to share um, knowledge with the public in a very 
uh, in a less scientific way and in a very fun way. So if you are on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter, you can get to learn more about different uh, birds in Kenya. You can also get to learn about um, uh, our about uh, uh, reptiles and amphibians, mammals, and also there are other people who've come up with innovative ways of telling conservation stories via pictures, vlogs, blogs, and we also have local documentaries which feature local scientists and initiatives in Kenya. And this shows just how much researchers are tapping into technology to try and get the public informed and involved with conservation issues in Kenya. And another way that the uh, technology is being used is with the advertising of different campaigns uh, for different species uh, during different times of the year. And I find this to be very creative and it's a really good way to actually reach, um, reach out to both the, law, um, the urban community and the grassroots community. So another thing uh, with um, another topic I'll focus on with the opportunities is with government involvement. I think if we if you actually look at it, uh, if you critically look at the conservation scene, you'll see that the uh, the government is the one of the institutions that high, is highly criticized uh, for the uh, is highly criticized when it comes to several conservation issues. But I think it's good to actually acknowledge some of the efforts they've made of the, over the years to try and improve the conservation of biodiversity in Kenya. So one of the things that the government has played a big role in is with the formulation and amendment of wildlife laws. Um, uh, for instance, um, in the constitution that was, amendment, that was amended in 2010, um, the government um, introduced a lot of clauses that supported wildlife conservation um, and management. Also, um, in 2013, the government passed a new law, a, a new wildlife conservation and management um, act or law, and this um, this updated um, so many old laws because the last wildlife act we had was in eight, 1989. So, with this particular, um, with this new act a lot of changes um, that are up to date. A lot of laws have been updated and they're actually benefiting um, the public. Second, uh, and I think Cynthia mentioned, Kenya is signatory to, re to several regional and international water laws and treaties, such as the CITES and CBD. And this shows just how much Kenya is intentional in contributing to the not only local, but regional and international um, conservation of biodiversity. Another interesting thing I think the government did was that um, our Kenyan government came up with a de de development blueprint um, that aims to make Kenya a middle-class country by 2030. But um, in this particular document or in this particular program, they did not only focus on development, but they also considered biodiversity conservation. And one of the things they talk about and they have actually done is with the mapping of wildlife corridors and dispersal areas in the whole of Kenya. And this has been documented in this particular, uh, this particular book. Another thing that I, I think the government has done and should be uh, applauded is with the uh, conducting of uh, wildlife population census. Um, in the whole of Kenya, and they did that, and they are mandated to do this after every five years in order to come up with a baseline of the wildlife population trends in Kenya. And they did the last one in April to July 2021. And if you look, um, if you if you are interested to learn more about the population trends, you can look at this particular document. Um, yeah, so there are many more challenges maybe which we can get to, um, I'm sorry, there are many more opportunities which we can get to discuss later, but I thought um, this one's actually um, are the main ones we can talk and um, we can talk about. So now I'll slowly move into the challenges that are facing conservation, the conservation scene in Kenya. And the first one, and I think this is affecting most countries is with biodiversity loss. So the issue, the thing with biodiversity loss in Kenya is that um, 
we have an average decline of wildlife or the average decline of wildlife is 68%. And this was the trend that was observed between 1977 and 2016 in the arid and semi-arid lands where most of the wildlife um, exist. And the reasons or the main causes of um, biodiversity loss was due to the rapid human population growth and which results into encroachment um, of, of people into protected areas or wildlife areas. There's also degradation and fragmentation of um, wildlife areas and climate change and variability. But the thing with, that makes biodiversity loss a bit complicated in Kenya is that we lack data on the status and trends of some species at national and county level. So it's actually hard to say that or this species has decreased by 30% because we don't have data or enough data to make such conclusions. Another thing is that um, the status of some taxonomic groups, especially reptiles and amphibians is unknown because in the past, these are the species which researchers actually ignored due to several reasons. So it's actually difficult to pinpoint um, the biodiversity loss trends in Kenya, but I think some efforts are being made to try and um, um, improve this, uh, this situation. Um, another challenge that's facing uh, the conservation scene is in Kenya is with the conservancy model. Um, I think uh, we talked, as I, I had um, earlier presented, I said that there's a lot of conservation activity that's happening outside our protected areas. And um, outside protected areas, we have these um, organizations called conservancies, and this is mostly community or private land where people come together and form a conservancy and the main activity that takes place in this particular area is regarding is with wildlife conservation. The only the only or the main land use is um, keeping wildlife, um, yeah, or conserving wildlife. But then, if you look at this conservancy model, I find it to be a great idea. But um, if you if you go to the ground or if you talk to local communities that are participating in this. Um, conservancies or who have donated their land to form conservancies, you'll find that it's actually a very controversial topic. So you find some of the local communities uh, complaining that um, conservation seems to be the new colonialism because they are actually losing their land or they feel like their land is grabbed um, uh, um, in the name of conservation or in the name of taking care of wildlife. So they miss out on certain opportunities, such that, um, for example, they are not allowed to graze their livestock in certain areas. Yeah, so they feel a bit aggrieved and denied of their rights to use their ancestral land. Another thing with the conservancy model that's making it a bit controvers controversial is that um, some of the people who are investing in these conservancies are actually foreigners and non-locals. And um, so I think some for some community members, they find it a bit uncomfortable to have more foreigners, um, uh, you see, owning their land or leasing their land and also coming up with rules on how they should and should not use their land. So this is proving to be a bit um, controversial. Um, to, be to be a bit controversial um, at the moment. Another issue um, that's facing uh, the conservation scene in Kenya is with human wildlife conflict. So human wildlife conflict can be simply described as uh, when the needs and behavior of wildlife or humans negatively affect each other. And it can, in, um, and human wildlife conflict can include damage to crops, property, death or injury to people and livestock. So uh, human wildlife conflict has several impacts and I'll just look at two impacts. One of the impact is the socioeconomic impact and this is what usually affects the communities because most of the communities living next to wildlife are pastoralists and rely on their livestock and cattle for, for their livelihoods. So when you have 
a lion or a leopard or elephants coming to destroy or kill your livelihoods, it seems that the, it means that um, your source of livelihood will be affected and it might lead to poverty and stuff. So, um, so this is one of the impact of human wildlife conflict. Another issue with human wildlife conflict is with the, is the ecological impact it has. So when the communities are really um, uh, angry or they feel, when the community are angry with the human wildlife conflict from let's say carnivores, uh, one thing they can do is to retaliate. And a retaliation can mean that they end up attacking wildlife or they end up killing animals they feel are responsible for their loss, for their losses. And as you can see, this will have really high ecological impacts on the, or this might affect the biodiversity in the area. So we have a, such a case in 2012 whereby um, a lion went to a, a pastoral community and killed some livestock, but the community was so angry with this situation or this incident that they retaliated and ended up killing six, six lions um, to show just how angry they were. And yeah, so you see it has, um, yeah, and this has for sure, this for sure has um, ecological impacts. So if we look at the solutions that uh, different non-governmental organizations and the government has come up with, um, they have tried to do translocation of uh, problem animals, fencing of fencing of, of uh, protected areas so that you don't have wildlife going into community areas. They try to encourage the community uh, to try and do better husbandry practices with their livestock. And another thing they try to do is to offer monetary compensation for their losses. But this last solution, which is monetary compensation, has also proven to be another controversy um, in human um, in the um, um, in issues related to human wildlife co conflict, um, because um, the government is actually receiving really low budgetary allocations that. Or, or for funds that will go into the compensation. So you find that um, most communities are actually, or most people affected by human wildlife conflict incidences are sometimes not compensated or they are compensated years after, after the incident happened. And sometimes some of the amount of money they are given cannot equate to the, um, to the livestock they lost. Cause for example, you have, a breed of a cattle that's worth, let's say, 5,000 euros, and you get as a compensation 500 euros. So it seems to be, yeah, it seems that this monetary compensation is not um, actually working for the benefit of the community and the wildlife, even though the government is trying. Okay. Um, uh, another uh, challenge the conservation uh, the co conservation in Kenya is facing is with climate change. So first, um, uh, uh, I will tell you about the seasons in Kenya. So in Kenya, we actually have two main seasons. We have the dry season and the wet season. So the wet season we have uh, oh, and with the wet season we have uh, two seasons. We have two periods. Sorry, so we have the long rains which is usually from March to May and we have the short rains that take place from October to December. So with climate change what, what has been happening is that the frequency and severity of, of droughts and flash floods has increased over the years and with the frequency of the drought um, it has been observed by climate scientists that uh, droughts are happening after we are having droughts after every two years or just one year compared to the past where the drought cycles will take five to ten years and the issue with having such short drought um, cycles is that th this is not enough for the regeneration of water resources and pasture for livestock and what this means is that um, yeah, there's a lot of, um, it leads to, like there are certain effects that, um, like it, it will lead to certain effects, sorry. 
So um, recently in Kenya, we had uh, a serious, we had, we faced such an issue whereby we had two poor consecutive rainy seasons. So we missed out or we had very poor um, short rains in 2020 and the 2021 long rains also failed. And what happened is that um, the president of Kenya ended up declaring drought as a national disaster. And what we could see in the news is things like, um, is messages like this, because we had uh, livelihoods affected, livestock affected, and also wildlife was affected. So what we ended up seeing was such uh, messages on social media. Another thing that happens when we have drought in Kenya is that, or, or due to climate change, is that we have an increase in conflict in some regions in Kenya. This is because when you have, when in your area you have less water and pasture for your livestock, you will move around other areas in search of these resources. But when you move to other areas, you might ignite some tension with the communities that are there and that are also trying to utilize the same resources. So this has this shows that when we have drought, it has a cascading effect. And it actually affects not just people, but it also increases conflict for resources between communities and conservationists. And this is really a big problem. So um, last but not least, I'll talk about infrastructure development and conservation. Um, so if we look at infrastructural development, we can see that with the existing um, infrastructure, that is the road, the railway, especially these ones, the, the, especially the ones that pass in protected areas, um, they actually affect um, biodiversity in that some wildlife tend to be knocked down by vehicles leading to injury or, or death. So this is one aspect of infrastructure development and how it affects conservation. So in Kenya, we have this big project at the moment um, uh, for developing our infrastructure in order to become a middle-class country. And with this particular project, uh, the government is planning to build, um, has two develop, development, uh, deve developmental corridors. Um, and uh, this is the first one, which is called Lapset, which runs all the way from the coastal region to the northern part of Kenya. And you also have a second developmental project, which is called the Standard Gauge Railway Line, that, that once again runs from the coastal region to the western part of Kenya. The issue with these de developmental projects is that some of them are actually cutting across or encroaching protected areas. And for sure, this might have an effect on connectivity, survival, and survival of species. So I think. Um, yeah, this will become a challenge in the later years. So other challenges that are actually facing the conservation scene in Kenya include low budgetary allocations for conservation, emphasis on tourism at the expense of conservation, also an over-dependence on tourism. And we actually got to see how the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown affected uh, tourism and conservation in Kenya um, in the past two years. Another issue is with conflicting policies and laws, corruption, human rights abuse, unequal distribution of benefits, um, and the perception of conservation as the new colonialism, as you can see from these two books or these two posters. And last but not least, um, we have an issue of poaching and um, illegal trade of species. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and then we thought to share with you just uh, some recommendations of some books and some videos and articles that we found very interesting to read and uh, that are usually sometimes controversial and sometimes just uh, informative and a little bit of both. Um, so, for example, uh, at the moment, there's a, a lot of discussion about this particular book, The Big Conservation Lie uh, by Modakai Ogada. He's a Kenyan um, conservationist and uh, um, an author. 
he's uh, written uh, quite a good number of books actually. And he's, um, like Noreen sometimes puts it, he is uh, a, a very uh, interesting guy when it comes to these issues of conservation because he's often very critical of various groups. Um, he criticized Kenyans, for example, for not um, uh, taking the space uh, in terms of conservation uh, and not uh, directly participating as much as they should. Um, he also says that the conservation uh, in Kenya is uh, still uh, very much uh, directed and governed by uh, the foreign groups or so foreign institutions and uh, even individuals. And um, yeah, so if you should sometimes have a read at the book, you could, if you follow him also in some of his social media groups, you'll see sometimes he has some discussions. I've attended some book reviews that he's uh, participated in or even uh, his own book review as well. And you can also watch some v YouTube videos of some events that he's uh, been invited to. He's a very interesting guy to listen to in when you want to know more about the conservation space in Kenya. Um, there is also a journal article about uh, a young boy, his name is Masai, Masai Richard, uh, I think, uh, I think Masai Richard Turere, is it? A young boy, 13 years old now, but uh, that started um, uh, keeping, uh, helping his father uh, with grazing their cows uh, since he was about nine years old. And some time uh, ago, he found this, uh, he chased lions using this flashlight. Uh, I think Noreen also mentioned him earlier in, her, in the presentation. And um, if you read more about him, you, you'll find he's a very, it's a very interesting concept and it's now really being used in the country already. Um, even during my data collection, I noticed that there are people in the villages in the Mara that uses it to protect their cattle from, from lions and from wildlife, um, just to reduce the conflict between uh, human wildlife conflict. So it's, it's a very interesting uh, concept and a very impressive young man. Um, there is also this, uh, uh, journal article about uh, also sometimes addressing the issue of conservancies and whether or not the conservancy model is more also a, a land grabbing front. So it's uh, it's usually a very controversial uh, discussion about conservancy. There are usually very many controversial conservation, uh, con conversations about conservancies. And uh, even though the concept itself is supposed to be a very positive uh, issue, a very positive model, but like many things, it's not without uh, the pros and cons. Uh, so there, there have been quite some issues, even in courts, about uh, people uh, front selling, uh, com coming up as uh, community conservation committees or leaders. And then after some time, people, uh, there have been reports of people not being able to get back their land or people saying that they've been pushed out of their land because they, the uh, conservations are being, conservancies are being formed and then they end up losing uh, their land uh, because of all this, that it's important corridors and then they're not compensated. It's a, yeah, it's it's an and it's an issue that will take quite some time to really resolve. And uh, yeah, you could have a, a read, and you'd see also suggestions once you open some of its links. And then there's also the issue of why hunting animals is uh, interesting. If you, uh, it's not directly uh, linked to Kenya because in Kenya uh, hunting uh, is illegal. But the article is still very interesting in The Economist. There's also a, a, a video on YouTube on, on this. It's a very interesting uh, uh, 
video and maybe if you have a look at it you could uh, share sometimes what your view is uh, on this because there are again very many points of view on whether or not it's uh, it's something interesting in fact in Kenya right now uh, there's there's some debates on whether or not we should legalize hunting it's it's also a discussion so it's not that we are exactly uh, safe from hunting it's just that it's at the moment it's still illegal and we in my view personal view i hope that that stays the case but um you never know with some of this uh concept some of these models they just they, there are people who support them and then they move forward yeah so if just in case you're really interested in this uh, issue of conservation uh, you could have a look at some of these uh, recommendations and hope that you enjoy the reading of videos and yeah and then yeah some of our topics and thank you